1620, while the Mayflower was in Provincetown, 18 of its men sailed in a small shallop, searching for a place to live. They came to present-day East Ham, where they were met by a group of Nosset. After a brief but violent encounter, the English left towards today's Plymouth. In 2020, we remember this first encounter. We explore its meanings for today and tomorrow. My name is Joanna Hollick, and I'm the coordinator of the Sunset Series with East Ham 400. I'm here today with Tom Ryan, the vice chair of the East Ham 400 Commemoration Committee. Welcome, Tom. Thank you. We're going to be speaking tonight about the passengers who were on the Mayflower. During the sequence of readings we're doing on Sunday nights from Ian Saxene's book, we're at the point now where the English have boarded the Mayflower and are about to sail uh, to Cape Cod. They don't know they're going to Cape Cod. Uh, during this uh, description of the passages on the Mayflower, uh, Joanna will be reading a couple of passages from a new book by John Turner. And I'm going to put it here so the camera can see it. And they knew they were pilgrims. They knew they were pilgrims. Uh, is copyrighted 2020. Uh, it is highly recommended by Jeremy Bangs, a famous professor in Leiden, Netherlands, and also by Michael Winship, author of Hot Protestants. Uh, so many sides of the debates about the pilgrims recommend this groundbreaking new book. They knew they were pilgrims, and we'll hear a couple of passages from that. So we want to describe the passengers on the Mayflower as it left Plymouth, England, to come to Virginia. Uh, first, there were several groups. The first group were members of the congregation that had been staying and living in Leiden, Netherlands for some years. How many members of the congregation were there? 48. And then they brought with them their indentured servants. Uh, because we often skip over this reality of the servants and we don't honor them for their lives, uh, Joanna will read their names and ages. William Budden, a youth. Dorothy, a teenager. John Hook, age 13. John Howland, about 21. William Latham, age 11. Desire Minter. Ellen Moore, age 8, who was assigned as a servant of Edward Winslow. She died from illness sometime in November 1620, soon after the arrival of the Mayflower in Cape Cod Harbor, and was likely buried ashore there in an unmarked grave. Jasper Moore, age seven, who was indentured to John Carver. He died from illness on board the Mayflower on December 6, 1620, and was likely buried ashore on Cape Cod in an unmarked grave. Richard Moore, age six, indentured to William Brewster. He is buried in the Charter Street burial ground in Salem, Massachusetts. He is the only Mayflower passenger to have his gravestone still where it was originally placed sometime in the mid-1690s. Also buried nearby in the same cemetery were his wives, Christian Hunter Moore and Jane Moore. Mary Moore, age four, assigned as a servant of William Brewster. She died sometime in the winter of 1620 or 1621. She and her sister Ellen are recognized on the Pilgrim Memorial Tomb in Plymouth. George Soule, who was between the ages of 21 and 25. Elias Story, who was under 21 years old. And Roger Wilder, also under age 21. In addition to the 48 members of the congregation of Leiden and those indentured servants uh, that were with them. Uh, there was another group brought on board, merchants or adventurers, sometimes called strangers. They were brought on to make the trip affordable, to have the right kind of financing to make this possible. And how many of them were there? 31. And those 31 uh, had some indentured servants with them so that we can honor them and their role. Let's hear their names and ages. Robert Carter, a teenager. Edward Doty, age probably about 21. William Holbeck, likely under age 21. John Langamore, 
under age 21, Edward Leister, aged over 21, and Edward Thompson, or Thompson, age under 21. In addition to the strangers or adventurers in their servants, the Holy Congregation and their servants, there were about 44 officers and crew whose intention was to get out of Virginia or wherever they landed as soon as possible and return to England. About half of them died during the first winter after arrival before they could sail away. And then in April of 1621, the half that lived the 22 or so returned to England. Now reading from They Knew They Were Pilgrims. In his history, Bradford recounted two stories that illustrate how the pilgrims made sense of the events of the crossing. Aboard the Mayflower was a sailor who would always be condemning the poor people in their sickness and cursing them daily with grievous execrations. This seasoned sailor looked down on the seasick landlubbers around him and looked forward to taking their belongings once he had tossed their corpses into the deep. Then, not yet halfway across the Atlantic, God chose to smite this young man with a grievous disease. Even his fellow sailors agreed it was just the hand of God upon him. They tossed him into the sea. Conversely, Bradford asserted that God saved John Howland, a servant of John Carver. Howland unwisely came above deck during a fierce storm and fell into the sea. Just as God had chosen to slay the profane seaman, so it pleased God to save a godly servant. Howland caught hold of a rope. The sailors pulled him out of the water and used a boat hook to bring him back aboard. Four children became Mayflower passengers in scandalous circumstances. They were the spurious brood of one Samuel Moore. In order to consolidate and preserve his family's property, Moore's father had arranged a marriage between the 17-year-old Samuel and a relative six years his senior. Two sons and two daughters arrived at a rapid clip between 1612 and 1616, but by then Samuel Moore realized that another man had been fathering them. The cuckolded Moore, in short order, disinherited his children, sued his wife's lover, and annulled his marriage. Moore next acted to get rid of the children. He later wrote, that he decided to free them of the blots and blemishes of bastardy, but he chose a callous, if effective, way of freeing himself from them. The first ship sailing for Virginia happened to be the Mayflower. Moore invested money on behalf of each child, and a servant handed the children over to Cushman and Weston. The Carvers and Winslows each took one child. William and Mary Brewster added the remaining two to their household. In the span of a few years, the spurious brood had lost their parents, property, and homeland. In his famous novel, Cape Cod, William Martin has this evocative quotation. The people of the first light, the Wampanoag, would look to the eastern horizon as the home of dawn. And now they, and now they looked to the east for large canoes called ships. Now a ship, a large canoe arrived from the east, not bringing dawn, but bringing women and children, meaning they were here to stay. My name is Joanna Hollick. Thank you for your support of the Sunset Series and East Ham 400. If you're interested in supporting East Ham 400 efforts by purchasing commemorative items, we do have several items for sale on our website, easthamp400.org. We are selling gold foil first encounter ornaments, t-shirts with the East Ham 400 logo, and montages made by a local artist. The ornaments feature an image of the shallop and come with a special description card. The t-shirts are available in light blue, navy, and ash gray, and in sizes adult small through 3XL. The montage depicts watercolor images of important historic and well-known landmarks around the town of East Ham. Each of these items are $20. Thank you.